Now, we've all been hearing a lot about the white media making much ado about the South Carolina primary, particularly what it portends for the black vote, because, of course, they're keeping an eye on us because we are the barometer by which they measure the health of white supremacy. As long as black people are doing poorly economically and are politically dysfunctional, then white supremacy is fine and dandy. But of course, they got to check in occasionally just to make sure that black people are still going for the old con game, just to make sure that they still got us fooled. In the last election in 2016, something happened that they hadn't anticipated. They were just so sure that they had done a good job of creating the media narrative that Donald Trump is an intolerable threat to black America. Why, no matter what you thought of Barack Obama, the political backlash against Barack Obama's race-neutral policies, well, you need to overlook that because we can't have four years of Trump. That was the narrative. Because black people, led by the black media, had gotten on board with the message that Barack Obama didn't do anything for us and we're not voting for anyone who does not bring us tangibles. We didn't merely say, we're not voting for you because you didn't do something. We specifically said, what you have to bring us is money tangibles for us. Barack Obama's like, well, I'm bringing race neutral policies. So in other words, the status quo, that's what you're bringing. And the white media was very desperate to make sure that they got us off of that. But trying to use Trump as their boogeyman, the perennial, well, the Republicans are bad. So no matter what you think of the Democrats, don't you try to change anything. The Republicans are even worse. The scare tactic didn't work. And what they also realized was if black people were no longer going for the scare tactic, then what that meant was they were going to be digging in their heels to change the structure of the society. This was not going to be just tinkering around the edges. We're talking about a fundamental change in the calibration of the white supremacist racial machine in this country. And that's what black people seem to be setting the stage for. So they had the South Carolina primary and Joe Biden, to hear the white media tell it, why, these are just unprecedented numbers, oh, why, nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the republic, oh, it's pretty obvious that the Democrats have got their mojo back when it comes to the black vote, why, we, we were kind of off our prediction in 2016, ah, but this time, those niggers, they can't wait to vote for old Jim Crow Joe Biden this time, they can't wait to vote for the Democrats this time, why, they're just champing at the bit, and you can take South Carolina as a case study. Well, let's do that. Let's go ahead and look at South Carolina and see what it tells us. In 2008, when Barack Obama ran for the South Carolina primary, he got 55% of the overall vote and got 80% of black voters in that primary election. Yesterday, Jim Crow Joe Biden managed to get 61% of the black vote, and blacks were still a little more than half of the electorate. Now, that's a far cry from the 80% that Barack Obama got in 2008 and 2012 and the almost 85% that Hillary Clinton got in 2016. We'll get to that in just a moment. But the overall number of voters in South Carolina's primary was 532,000 in 2008. That means 292,600 black people turned out to vote that primary election. However, this time, the overall number of voters was 528,000. So, black voters were about 373,000 this cycle. That's a higher numerical number, but we've seen this one before. While this does mean that the white media has succeeded in getting out the 65 to dead demo, they've been in this position before, having high vote black voter turnout in the primary only to watch it implode by the time they got to the general election. South Carolina's Post and Courier reported last year that the state's population had grown numerically, but its white population received the biggest benefit of that population boost. The state has acted as a magnet to white residents, mostly retirees heading to the coast. The white population of South Carolina comprises nearly 69% of the population, the same percentage that they held in 1960. So if nothing else, you got to give the good old boys credit in South Carolina. In the last 70 years, they've managed to keep the percentage of white residents of South Carolina stable. The black population of South Carolina, on the other hand, has remained virtually unchanged, 
frozen at 28%, which is only one measly percentage point more than the 27% it had been in 2010. So what that means is while the white population has grown in the last 10 years in South Carolina, the black population has remained the same. So this means that Joe Biden's got black support running away because the white media says so, right? I mean, after all, South Carolina is their first case study. And as we all know, black people are one gigantic monolith. And if Joe Biden can get support there, if the Democrats are able to get black voter turnout in one place, why? That means they'll get it all over the country, right? Right? Well, actually, no. Because all you have to do is go back a mere four years and our friends over at the Aryan Broadcasting Company, I mean um, ABC News, they were talking about the 2016 South Carolina primary. Black voters also comprised 61% of the vote in that primary too. And Hillary Clinton got 85% of the black vote, not 61%, which was more than Barack Obama had gotten. Why, the way the white media saw it, it was a no-brainer that black voters were not going to be staying home on election day. Why, the black voters, they were just boiling over with rage at the mere prospect of a President Trump, and they couldn't wait to vote for a Democrat. Why, black people were going to forget all about the attacks and indignities of the eight years, disastrous years of Obama, and they certainly were going to forget all about the real changes that they were now demanding, and instead it was going to be all hands on deck to stop Trump. But of course, as early voting got underway on November 1st, the white media was noticeably deflated. The black voters who they were so sure couldn't wait to vote seemed to be waiting to vote. The white media, desperately trying to keep their narrative alive, blamed this low black voter turnout in early voting on voter suppression by the Republicans. Well, I guess the GOP took eight years off between 2008 and 2016, huh? I guess the GOP had decided a black man's running for president. Well, we're not going to try to suppress the vote in 2008. Won't try to suppress it in the 2010 midterms. Won't try to suppress it when this black guy runs for re-election. And won't even try to suppress it in 2014. We'll wait until 2016. We'll wait until a white woman's running. Then we'll try to suppress the black vote. That's what the white media wants you to believe. Look, family, let's put this crock of crap to bed. While it is undeniably true that the grand old perverts are always ginning up some racist trick come election time, it's also undeniably true that if properly galvanized, the black vote will turn out in numbers sufficient to overwhelm any GOP suppression campaign. We did it twice in a row. So the problem is not that the Republicans suppressed the vote. The problem happened to be black voters were not galvanized, but the white media can't go with that because the second that you say the black vote stayed home because they were disgusted, now you got to ask, well, A, what is it the black vote was disgusted with? And B, what is it the black voters want if you're going to get them back to the polls? This is all one gigantic political operation by the white media and by the administrative arm of white supremacy working together, trying to figure out how do we get black folks to get back on board with the electoral fraud without actually giving them anything. No, the problem was the black voters may have been enthused enough to vote in the primary in 2016, but as the election continued, they realized that no one was offering black voters anything and that no amount of support would make Hillary do for us what she had done for every other constituency, pledge tangibles. She was trying to figure out how does she talk her way into the White House. Well, we're not going to be dazzling the black vote with any diamonds because diamonds are tangible. So instead, we're going to try to baffle them with BS and we're going to try to figure out how to intimidate them with scare talk. Old Negro Jim Clyburn, he was leading the charge. Don't y'all be making no demands. And Miss Hilly, y'all don't be making no demands. You need to turn out to votes. That's what Jim Crow Clyburn was all about. Negro Jim Clyburn is what I think I'm going to start calling him because that's what he acts like. And this 
Modern day slave was telling black people, well, you don't need any tangibles. Why? The most important thing is that you carry water for this or that white politician and continue the policies that have left you out in the cold. Don't you worry about demanding anything. You make sure that Miss Hilly gets elected and that's enough for you. Well, it turned out it wasn't enough for the black vote. No matter how promising the primaries may have looked in 2016, the reality was the black vote was making it clear. You have to actually pledge tangibles to us, and there's no getting around that. But it was the Washington Post itself who, four years ago, wrote a story about Hillary Clinton's massive win among black voters in South Carolina and what it really meant. Because, as I mentioned before, in 2016, Hillary Clinton managed to get 85% of black voters in the South Carolina primary to vote for her. That was a bigger percentage than Barack Obama. But when you looked at the actual raw numbers, what you saw was the numbers were actually smaller. So, yeah, she managed to get 85% of black voters in the 2016 Democratic primary. But the problem was, out of the 370,000 people who turned out to vote in the 2016 South Carolina primary, 314,000 of them were black. Now, that was actually higher than the percentage that Barack Obama got in 2008. He had about 292,600 black people who turned out in the South Carolina primary for him. But even so, you had a state representative who had told the nation that she was worried about the Democrats' chances in November. And the reason why was the overall numbers were down. And at the end of the day, black people are still part of this society. Yeah, black folks might have shown up as kind of a protest vote, but the question was how many of them were going to remain enthused all the way to Election Day? They could see the stress fractures forming as early as February. And it's not as if the white media didn't know the reason why. The Washington Post wrote a story about Hillary Clinton's huge, gigantic win among black voters in South Carolina in 2016. And one of the things that they pointed out was that Hillary Clinton was still having problems appealing to black voters in large numbers and getting the actual black vote out especially young black voters, which what would be necessary nationwide. Keep in mind, South Carolina in and of itself doesn't have the votes, even Democratic votes, even if all the black folks turned out, which is what it would require to actually carry the state of South Carolina. But it's a question of what does it mean nationwide? Now, the Washington Post did note that there were voters, those of color is how they try to typify them, but that means the black vote. Because Hispanics are like in the dang near the single digits in South Carolina and Asians even less. So when they're talking about voters of color, especially where the Democrats are concerned, they're talking about black voters. And talking about South Carolina, that means the black vote. So the black voters had made it very clear that they were not going to be listening to any more race neutral policies like Obama had done. That Hillary Clinton was going to have to address us through a race-specific policy. Now, this is in the Washington Post four years ago. Four years ago, they were saying the exact same thing in passing, trying to gloss it over and trying to bury it in words. But they, there it is, the same thing that we have been saying for at least a few years before the 2016 election. We're not going to tolerate any more race neutral policies because race neutral policy simply means that it's going to be going mostly to white people. We just won't say white. We'll simply say, as Hillary Clinton put it, hard working Americans or as Donald Trump put it, the forgotten man, both of which meaning white people. And what about black folks? Well, thugs, super predators. You see, they have a race neutral term for us, too. But we were determined that we were not going to have any more of this race neutral policies because it was obvious what that was about. It was benign neglect by another name. And Hillary Clinton was trying to figure out if she could BS her way past this black agenda. And she found out that she couldn't. And the white media was admitting this four years ago. So they know precisely what all is going on. They know exactly what's happening here and why it's happening.
Joe Biden's victory will be very short-lived, mainly because of the fact that he has not galvanized black voters nationwide. Sure, you might have some black folks who are showing up as a protest vote, but there's a lot of time between now and November. And more importantly than that, there's a lot of time for the black media to begin that steady drumbeat. And that's something that we have not necessarily even begun hitting the drum as hard as possible, mainly because you got to pick and choose your battles on that when you can't be doing it all the time. But now it is time to begin the official drumbeat. No tangibles, no vote. No reparations, no vote. No black agenda, no black votes. Don't let the white media run some rhetorical con game on you trying to talk up Joe Biden and trying to pull some Jedi mind trick that, oh, the black community cannot wait to vote for some Democrat. That's what they're trying. The white media is rinsing and repeating the same narrative we heard four years ago with almost exactly the same numbers. There's also something else to remember about the South Carolina primary. Both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton lost. In the general election in both those the years that they run, 2008, 2012, and 2016, the Democrats lost all three times. And the fact that the white voters become galvanized is a harbinger for what the 2020 general election holds, because that was one thing that the white media was kind of glossing over in their story, that there had been a big increase in particular in the white and upper income areas of South Carolina. And that's a rather, for those of a left-wing bent, that's a rather ominous political development. Oh, sure, black people might be wanting to register their very justified rage at the racist-in-chief, but the thing is, there seems to be a lot of white folks who decide they want to turn out as well. And as we've seen with white women four years ago, they'll be sitting there giving a tisk-tisk to sexual harassment and all the rest of it, but uh, a lot of those folks all of a sudden will turn into Republicans for the day when it comes time for a candidate who's going to be putting white supremacy first. So that's something that needs to be remembered. Sure, they can try to say that there's that black voters have actually increased 25% this primary over 2016. Yeah, and the white turnout was increased 40%. That's the part of the story that the white media wanted to gloss over. Because they're trying to push the narrative that Negroes, you you guys are getting back on board with this electoral fraud, whether you know it or not. Meanwhile, they're not pointing out that the parts of South Carolina that had the largest spikes in voter turnout were mostly white. So what does this mean? Well, as far as Joe Biden's concerned, don't mean a whole lot. He's not charismatic and he's not going to become charismatic between now and November. He also can't run from his record. And he is not about to actually get on board with tangibles. So for him, it doesn't really matter which one of this menagerie of goofballs gets the nomination. One of these clowns will. What we are doing is not a fight to try to stop someone from getting the Democratic nomination. It's a matter of a fight to begin those black tangibles. Joe Biden was only too glad to help sponsor the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, and that was the law that created the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. It was a racially targeted law. Some of the old tricks that he had learned from those Southern segregationists. Joe Biden wasn't about to pass any sort of law like that regarding meth. Anything that it seems a drug predominantly taken by whites, any sort of substance abuse primarily in the white community, we're not about to punish that. We don't have zero tolerance for that. Why, that's a public health concern. Well, what are you talking about? They're shooting at cops. They're killing each other in the streets, fighting over drug turf. Well, um, well, that, that's a public health concern. Okay, and what about the crack epidemic, largely sponsored and made possible by the U.S. government? Well, that's a criminal justice issue. We need more prisons, more bars. These people know exactly what they're doing. Biden was also the author of the 94 crime bill, which at the time he bragged was Biden's law. And Bernie Sanders voted for it. So how much legislation has Biden sponsored, written, or advocated for to undo the damage the Biden's law caused? Or the 1986 Drug Abuse Act? Hey, how about Bernie Sanders? 
Has he been out there trying to push, actually putting forward legislation to repair the damage of Biden's law? How much, how, how many campaigns has Bernie Sanders run on the platform that we must undo the damage of Biden's law? How many, how much legislation has he put forward? I'll wait. The white media can get all happy all they want about South Carolina, but in reality, it's wishful thinking on their part. They see this as a political litmus test for whether or not the black community is back on board with the racial fraud. Have, has enough time passed? Have they thrown up enough distractions to get black people off that tangibles thing? Are black people going to overlook reparations and move on? Because after all, the candidates have stopped talking about it. So surely the black community, you know, we've made the pivot. We pivoted very smoothly. We, why? We dropped the reparations talking. You didn't even notice it, right? Right? That's what they're testing right now. They want to know, is the black vote back on the political treadmill to nowhere again? Have they abandoned tangibles and returned to voting for nothing? That's what they're asking us. Now, we've had a few of the Biden butter biscuit bootlicks and some of the Bernie brothers in the comment section who have been, or many of them, I'm sure, white sock puppet accounts, but not all of them. Some clowns who are trying these pathetically thinly veiled attempts, worthless as they are, to convince us that, oh, well, you see, black folks is getting on board with the, with the Democrats, and, well, it's just inevitable, and we might as well just find the best place we can, and, well, you know, we made a good effort, but this ain't 2016, and, well, things have changed, and Trump has, has ticked off a lot of black folks, and he's antagonized the black vote and scared half the black folks are are angry at Trump. The other half are intimidated by him. And well, that's just the way it is. You got a lot of folks who are trying to find some slick way of saying, drop the tangibles talk, drop the reparations talk, stop insisting that black people have the black agenda at the forefront of American politics. And well, you're going to have to vote for someone and that's just inevitable. And well, you might as well just give up. There's a whole gaggle, well, not a gaggle, more like a couple of handfuls of idiots who are trying that. And these, these fools must think that we haven't seen this before. They must think to themselves that they're being real slick when they're not. Family, you need to be looking out for these people who are just popping up, bombing into the comments section long enough to say, uh, black folks is getting it to vote. It's sad, but they doing it. So we might as well make our peace with it. And let's find a candidate to vote for. Why, that's what a dunce has pivoted to. We told you that those clowns were going to do that. And now here they are basically saying, vote for Bernie. Well, whatever happened to we're not voting without a candidate? Well, when you're trying to become some sort of Washington insider or when you're desperately hoping for a political consultancy gig, you have no such thing and no room for principles. So what's happening is, is we're getting closer and closer to yet another election where the black vote is going to be registering their ire with their feet. And making it clear that we were serious when we said no tangibles, no vote. What's happening is the people who are trying to still get something, the Negroes who are still hoping to get something from white supremacy, they're showing their true colors. This is an attempt by a number of these sellouts and traitors for the sake of trying to figure out, can they weaken our resolve? And what they'll do is they'll say, well, if a few geriatrics out in South Carolina decided to vote for nothing, well, all of you should vote for nothing because you're all just one big nigger. You're all just one big monolith and you're all the same. And black folks have been falling for this con all this time. So why stop now? So family, we must double and redouble our efforts. As this election gets underway, we have got to make sure the black vote understands you are out of order if you go running around talking about voting for somebody and they have not pledged to us our tangibles. There is a zero tolerance policy in place for Negroes advocating to be part of an electoral system that has not pledged anything to you. Those backward Negroes who are trying to get us to do the electoral process backwards, we're not listening to them and we're going to make sure that they understand they're going to be driven out. There is no tolerance for them. Elections are about who gets what. And so far, they haven't told black folks a damn thing we're going to get other than the warm glow of seeing some undeserving white politician take office. Because God knows well, the country hasn't had that before. What a historic moment. 
It doesn't matter who's in the White House. What matters is what are they putting in our pockets? And if our pockets happen to be empty as a result of their policies, then guess what's going to happen to those voting booths on Election Day? They're also going to be empty. We are going to teach people to take us seriously, not because we're going to ask politely, but because we're going to show them how sharp our tongues and our elbows can be. We're going to show them just how sharp these elbows can be as we make sure to push our way into the arena of power. We're going to be heard whether they want to listen or not. That's why I've been passing around that little hashtag crash their party. We are not going to be politely asking permission. We're going to be making it clear this so-called political gathering, which is nothing more than an electoral clan meeting, is illegitimate unless you're spelling out exactly how many trillions of dollars of the nation's wealth that we generated that you're going to be handing over to us. Unless a solid raft of tangibles for black people whose ancestry goes back to slavery in this country is on the political agenda, then your political party and your candidates are illegitimate. Unless black tangibles happens to be one of the major planks of your policy platform, then you are out of order. And it is our job to make sure that they hear that they are out of order. You don't just sit back and, well, we're going to be twiddling our thumbs and we're going to be done with that. No, this is we have gone way beyond that because the white media has also put forward this lie that the only time black folks are ready to actually stand up and make some noise at a political gathering is when some Democrats send them there to carp about Donald Trump. Yeah, so you can argue about which one of the Democrats, mostly white, who aren't going to do a dang thing for you, which one of them is going to rule over us? We're not there to actually fight for ourselves. We're there to fight for LGBTs and immigrants and abortion and, and global warming. We're not there for black people. Because black people, we're the, we are the moral voice of everyone else. We're every, we're every other community's moral voice. We're the moral voice for every other possible movement and political impetus, but we don't speak for ourselves because we're slaves and a slave is interested in the well-being of everyone except for himself. It's time to educate them that there is a new generation who is here and that no, we understand exactly what we're dealing with. The Democrats are not our friends. We are not here to make nice with the Democrats. We understand that in order for these bastards to do what is right, we're going to have to force them to do things that they were not designed to do. And we got to be honest with ourselves about that. This is not a matter of, we're going to make the Democrats live up to their creed. Give me a break. They already made their creed obvious. They are the left hand of white supremacy. So we're going to take that hand, get in a hammer lock, and twist the damn thing until they say uncle. Or should I say, until they say Ogun. That's what our agenda must be. There are too many black folks who are ready to go ahead and make some noise at a political rally as long as they feel as if they have the approbation of the white powers that be. Oh, they'll show out and even get beaten up on as long as there's some white political factor who's going to be patting them on the head. If they feel like they're a martyr for some white political interest, then they'll do that. Because, you know, standing up for yourself and advocating for yourself, why, that would be selfish. Well, I have no stomach for anyone who tries to tell me that the survival of my people is somehow more than I should be asking for. Selfish? That's just fine. Dr. John Henry Clark instructed us that we are to practice the essential selfishness of survival. But I don't want to merely survive. I want to prosper. And what that means is we have to go beyond merely exercising selfishness. And that's what we are beginning the process to do. So first thing I have to do is to delegitimize these institutions of white supremacy in your eyes. You are not supposed to be looking at them as being some sort of hallowed institutions that you must preserve and protect. These happen to be the bastions of your enemies. These happen to be enemy installations that must be overrun. They are not populated by friends and political allies. They are populated by the very same racist, bigots, white supremacists, and anti-black zealots that we've always been dealing with. You should not look at the Democrats and see a political party any more than you look at the Republicans and see a political party. You should look at them both and see KK Claverns, because that's exactly what they are. These happen to be bulwarks of white supremacy, and you must regard them as such. 
You're not supposed to be trying to figure out how do I get the Democrats into power. It's a matter of how do I make these bastards work for me? And it's not a matter of let's be nice about it. No, you're going to have to make it very clear. I'll stop this damn operation from running altogether until you bend to my will. In recent years, you just look at the Middle East as a case study. I told you about what was happening in Iraq. There were a lot of individuals who were watching as puppets of the United States were being installed as a so-called government in Iraq. And they made it very clear, no, you're not going to be just front-loading our government with a whole bunch of flunkies and puppets and con men and a whole bunch of chumps that you groomed to be your puppets here. And they're supposed to be ruling over us. That's not going to be happening. There's going to be a seat at the table for us. Or what's going to happen is we'll make it where this thing is completely and thoroughly unworkable. We'll make, make it where the system is just simply and thoroughly unable to be contained or controlled. And you won't be able to get anything done. And the focus of our actions is not the Democrats themselves, not the Democratic leadership themselves. They're already caked off from their corporate interests. It's those primarily white people of a leftist bent for them to understand that in order for you to continue getting your undeserved goodies, guarantees, and giveaways from the left hand of white supremacy, there's going to have to be something major in it for the former slaves of this country. That's who the real target is. Oh, you don't like seeing Donald Trump in power? Well, in that case, then how much is it worth to you? Oh, they'll have stiff necks in the beginning, but when it hurts enough, well, when it hurts enough, everybody relents. When it hurts enough, this is a battle of wills. They're trying to figure out just how serious we are about what it is that we say that we want. How serious are we? Now, we start equivocating like a dunce has done. Like those fakers, frauds, phonies, and fools have done. If we start trying to cut deals and we're just, well, we got to pick the lesser of two evils and, well, we need to have some allies and coalition building. And if we do that, then what they'll say is, well, see, tempest in a teapot and things go back to the way they always were. Yeah, these Negroes weren't serious. They just need to blow off some steam. They were mad about Obama. I guess seeing a black, a black hand slapping them in the face kind of got the Negroes ire up. But they're back on board now because we outlasted them. Yeah, these Negroes, they, they ain't persistent for nothing. They are consistently inconsistent. They don't stick to their guns on anything. Just tell them no and let them know that nothing's coming and well, they'll go ahead and eventually cave in and say, well, what do you need us to do, Massa? That's what they're doing right now. They're trying to find out if it will work. So far, it is not. No matter what kind of feel-good fakery the white media is putting out, they know what the real mood of the black electorate is, and they know who it is who has informed and is largely responsible for setting that mood. But the job of making sure that our people get on code and stay on code is not merely the responsibility of the black media alone. It is the responsibility of us all. It is not for you to be waiting to see what Jason, Tariq, or myself happens to say or do. You know what the agenda is. We have to show the severity of our intent. We have to show our resolve. Right now, they feel as if they have some political safe spaces from the black agenda. And they'll, they'll fill those safe spaces with a whole bunch of butter biscuit bootlegs. They'll bring in Negro Jim Clyburn, almost slipped up there. They'll bring in some more of their hand-picked flunkies from the black community, some more house Negroes to get out there and try to sell the soap. But ultimately what they know is it's election day that matters. And that no matter how much happy talk they do, the longer that the primary goes on, the greater the chance for the black media to make it clear, hey, these bastards ain't said a damn word about our reparations. And no, we are not going to relent on that. Our tangibles are the black issue. And without it, you don't get the black vote. There aren't enough black baby boomers left for you to keep the old political con game going. So I'm going to close out this video essay by telling you once again, don't get yourself confused as to why it is we're doing this. This is not about trying to figure out how to mystically and magically stop some Democrat from getting the nomination. That would be impossible. One of these goofballs is going to get the nomination because someone has to. But the question for us is, 
are we doing everything we can to make it clear that tangible, starting with our reparations, is the black issue, and if there's no reparations, there's also no black vote either.